Okay. Happy Friday, everyone. Uh, we're gonna work through the last of the chapter one lectures today, dealing with vapor pressure and surface tension. Um, before we get there, just a couple quick announcements. I uh, worked out office hours with the TAs yesterday, so we'll have homework help hours on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays from 3.30 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. in G130 at SEMA Center. Okay, so we're going to have a, one of the homework TAs, either uh, Mike, Swaff Mike Swafford or Victor Ng, will be there. Uh, to help you work out any questions you have on the homeworks. This is in addition to my office hours, which are the hour right after class, for those of you that like to get a quick start on assignments. Um, next week, remember, you show up for your lab sections. We're not doing labs yet, but you're going to get a little primer on experimental approaches, and that's going to be in 3258, the Center. I posted the lab schedule on ICON. You should be able to see it there. It's got the locations and lab section times and which labs are which weeks. Um, so take a look at that. If you've got any confusion, let me know. Uh, I got a question at the end. <coughs> sorry, I got a question at the end of the last lecture about um, our discussion of viscosity and whether that has anything to do with this uh, thing that a few of you might have heard of called the no-slip condition. And the answer is yes. Actually, the no-slip condition is one of the most important ramifications we get from the idea of viscous fluids. And what the no-slip condition means is that fluid always matches the velocity of the surface that it is adjacent to. So when dye is injected into a moving fluid, notice that it sticks to the wall here. Okay? That's not because it's actually glued to the wall or adhered in any way. That means that the velocity at the wall is zero because the wall is not moving. And it takes some additional mechanical sort of uh, perturbation in order to get that dye to move away. Um, we'll talk later when we start getting into the idea of what are called boundary layers, about what this means in an engineering sense. But it, it pays to remember that whenever you have a boundary, there, there are no discontinuous velocities in fluids. Okay, That's the thing. It, a fluid particle is always going to be moving at the same velocity as a boundary next to it. Um, OK. So I want to quickly. We're going to jump to the page here for a second. Um, so the things we want to cover today, we're going to try to make good time through these. Um, or today's objectives, I'll say, are to first describe the concept um, and ramifications of vapor pressure. We want to be able to differentiate boiling, which is a very familiar phenomenon to all of you, and cavitation, which is something you may have heard of but probably have not heard much about. We want to be able to explain the effects surface tension, and we want to calculate capillary rise sets. and force due to surface tension. Um, if we run out of time to uh, Get all of this. We'll try to uh, we'll try to hit the important things that you guys need to know for the homework. Okay. So first off, the idea of vapor pressure. Right. Again, this is something that's probably going to be familiar from chemistry and other physical sciences. Um, <coughs> but the premise is fairly simple. Okay. If we take a box or a closed container, we fill it with a liquid, partially, and then we evacuate all of the air from the other part of the box. So we place it under a perfect vacuum. Okay. Um, what happens? Okay. We start to get uh, 
we start to get evaporation of the liquid <coughs> as the molecular energy starts to allow them to break free of the molecular cohesive forces in the liquid to become vapor. Right? And so you'll start to get this accumulation of the vaporous phase of whatever fluid you're working with inside of this vacuum chamber. Um, and it'll only, it'll only uh, approach equilibrium when the rate at which, if we zoom in on the surface of that liquid, right, we've got we've got evaporation, and then we've got condensation occurring simultaneously. Um, and when the rate of condensation and evaporation equalize, that is when, when molecules are becoming liquid just as fast as they're becoming vapor, uh, then we can say it's an equilibrium and that occurs when the pressure in this part, in the vaporous part, reaches the vapor pressure of that fluid. <coughs> Rates of condensation equalize when P oops, is equal to the vapor pressure, which we denote with P sub V. All right. Another way of thinking about this is let's take another closed container. Once again, let's fill it partially with liquid, but now we're, we're leaving this, you know, at atmospheric pressure. All right. So it, this could be any old, any old box fluid. But if we hook up, if we hook up a vacuum pump to this now, and we begin gradually pulling the air out of the container, and at the same time we measure the pressure inside the container, what we're going to see, if we plotted this sort of as a function of time, let's say here's time, here's pressure inside of the container, measured by that pressure gauge, right? It's going to decrease over time. And at some point, right, when that line crosses the vapor pressure of the fluid, then the fluid is going to begin to boil. That's, that's, uh, there are videos of this online, right? Sticking a, a cup of cold water into a vacuum chamber and just evacuating the pressure until it begins to resemble hot boiling water, but it's at room temperature. So these are both, these are different sides of the same coin. So the important thing here is the vapor pressure represents the equilibrium pressure between evaporation and condensation. Um, Okay, what happens to vapor pressure as the temperature changes, right? If, if we were to increase the, uh, the temperature of the liquid, would its vapor pressure increase or decrease? What, let's put it this way, you boil, you boil a pot of water at a, um, at, at atmospheric pressure, right, it boils at 100 degrees Celsius or 212 Fahrenheit, right? That means that at those temperatures, 100 degrees Celsius, the vapor pressure is one atmosphere. Right. What happens if you put it in a pressure cooker, right? Is it boiling at a higher temperature or a lower one? Higher, as the name would imply, right? That's the point of pressure cooker is, is that now that equilibrium state Right, because the temperature is higher, it doesn't. The vapor pressure increases. Um, so that will often look like is a curve, kind of like this. Okay, and we'll talk about the meaning of this cavitation versus boiling in just a second. Um, but right, if we have temperature on the x-axis and vapor pressure, or sorry, uh, pressure on the y-axis, and then this curve here indicates the vapor pressure. Right. The idea is that, in general, it's nonlinear, but in general, as the temperature increases, so will the vapor pressure. 
Um, one of the ramifications of this, and vice versa. Okay. So one of the ramifications of this is just as you boil, right? You might uh, boil a potato uh, at at 100 degrees Celsius, and it takes a certain amount of time to cook. If you, for some reason, lug the potato up on Everest with you, very poor, poor food choice, um, then it's only going to boil it because the pressure is now down here, right? It's now going to boil at a much lower temperature and take a lot longer to cook. So, um, yep. So that's what I have to say about pressure and uh, or vapor pressure and temperature. Um, so one of the other things about this, right, is uh, this idea of cavitation, which I showed on um, showed up on that slide there. Uh, so, right, if you lower the pressure in an entire container and all of the liquid inside of that container starts to bubble and it looks like boiling, we would appropriately call that boiling. Um, however, a thing happens in lots of fluid flows, uh, particularly when you're talking about flow through pipes and around propellers or around lifting surfaces. Um, we'll see in a couple of chapters that according to this guy named Bernoulli, when a fluid moves fast, its pressure tends to decrease. This is the working principle behind why planes fly. Um, and so if pressure moves fast enough, or if a fluid moves fast enough, its pressure can drop below the, lo the vapor pressure at whatever temperature it's at in a small region of flow. Okay, and this is what we call cavitation. So cavitation occurs when localized regions of a liquid experience pressure below the vapor pressure, which causes them to vaporize and create cavities in the surrounding liquid. So I've got a couple photos of what this looks like. As I said, um, this happens frequently in uh, things like propellers. So this is a, a guy I know out of Australia. He runs what's called a cavitation tunnel designed for studying this particular phenomenon. What you're seeing here is, um, you guys remember that photo I showed of a, of a wing on a plane had a vortex coming off of it the first day. Right? Um, vort vortices like that tend to create very high velocities. And propeller blades are really just wings that spin around really fast. So you get the same sort of tip vortices, as they're called. So what we're seeing right here are these vortices that are being shed off of the tips of these propellers, and they're spinning so quickly right? It's uh, that the pressure inside of those vortices drops below vapor pressure, and you get these little filaments of essentially boiling water. We also see it in, uh, oh, this is a, an example of one of those facilities. This is actually where I went to do uh, part of my research when I was at Michigan. Uh, this is a facility in Rome. Uh, up the upper left is a shot of the outside of this facility. It's about four stories tall. Uh, it's a flow channel. So much like a wind tunnel, but this one moves water through it. Uh, this is the test section of the flow channel. I'm hanging out down there trying to figure out uh, some accelerometers that didn't work. And this is a view from the control room. So water is flowing past, and we can see the water inside. And that video that was playing just a second ago is a shot of cavitation occurring over another wing-like structure. So here. The, um, the low pressures created by the, the kind of the wing behavior of this thing you're looking at uh, actually go below the vapor pressure and cause localized boiling. We also see cavitation in oops, back, in nature. Right? Um, there's uh, a particularly odd little critter called the mantis shrimp. Uh, that if I can get this video to play. Oops. Try it this way. Oh, there we go. 
Okay. Oh, now I'm going to open like 18 windows. Awesome. Um, all right. So the mantis shrimp uh, is a, it's a predatory shrimp, and the way it hunts is by using this sort of hammer thing it's got built into its claw. And uh, you'll see that as it pounds the, the living bejesus out of these snails right here, uh, it actually creates these little, these little flashes, right? Those aren't light. That's localized boiling of the water. And it's not because of high temperature. It's because the fluid is moving so fast to get out of the way of that claw that it drops beneath the press, uh, vapor pressure and boils. Okay? And it's actually evolved to use that localized boiling behavior and the shock waves that it creates as a way of cracking uh, mollusk shells. Because when you create a bubble of vapor, it tends to implode then, and that actually creates a force much greater than the original impact. This is a way, a method they use, cavitation is used in medical sciences. Uh, they'll use sound to create cavitation as a way of breaking up uh, kidney stones. It's being used now in experimental treatments for cancerous tumors, right? And uh, it's got a whole lot of uh, applications. It's a really interesting topic. We're not going to spend a huge amount of time talking about it in detail in this class because it's a little bit more advanced. Um, okay. Next, I want to talk about this idea of surface tension. Right? This is a familiar concept, again, the idea that something that's heavier than water can sometimes appear to float on the surface of the water. right? And if you punch it below the surface of the water, it'll sink like it has every reason to do. Um, this is used, again, in nature, for things like these water walkers. Um, and we want to know kind of what's the, what's the science here and how do we do calculations involving surface tension. So jump back over to the notes. And I want to get I want to get through the uh, kind of the delivery of material, and then I've got a couple examples, including some with vapor pressure and cavitation, um, that we'll come back to. So, uh, the idea with surface tension is whenever you have an interface between two fluids. Okay, so I'm going to draw another highly artistic tank of water. Okay, um, so imagine we've got this tank of water. That symbol, by the way, that triangle with a couple lines beneath it, means that that's known as a free surface. That's where there's a boundary. The water ends and air begins. Uh, so, right inside of the liquid phase of this water, right, all the molecules that are collected in here have these intermolecular cohesive bonds. Okay, and they're mutual. They push, or they sorry, they pull on one another equally with all their neighbors. Okay, so you have these kind of these bidirectional pushing and pulling behaviors that tends to keep, that tend to all balance out, right? The idea is that, that, um, that this guy in the middle is pulling on and being pulled on by all of his neighbors equally, and so the net force is effectively zero. When you have a molecule at the surface, half of those neighbors are gone, and as a result, you end up with an unbalanced force that tends to make all the molecules at the surface cling together. Um, and so that's the tension, right? Is that they're pulling on each other more than they're being pulled away by neighbors. Um, so we would say at a fluid surface, cohesion, sorry, uh, we'll just say attractive forces. pull molecules together. And as a result, they act like a uh, sort of a skin, a skin-like membrane that can support the weight of objects. It's not unlike the way that you would stand on a trampoline. Um, 
So this is the phenomena that allows things like soap bubbles to form. Uh, it gives round shapes to droplets of water. And as I showed before, it allows things to appear to walk on top of water surfaces. Uh, note that surface tension is not just for water. Right? It's, it's an, almost any liquid will have surface tension force. Water just happens to have a, a pretty high surface tension, and it makes a good example. So we describe surface tension, or we give it the, the variable here. Denoted as the Greek symbol sigma. And it has units of mass, length, times the negative two sets force <coughs> per unit length. And so those lengths cancel out. We end up with mass times the negative two. So a normal unit for surface tension would be like newtons per meter. Okay. Which seems like a strange choice of units. What does that really? What does that mean? You know, force per unit length. But what that allows us to do is calculate, for example, the force exerted by uh, surface tension effects. Force exerted by surface tension is written F equal to sigma times LC. Okay, so let's explain this. F is, as we might expect, force Right, C is the surface tension constant, and LC is what we'll call the length of the contact line between an object and liquid. This is probably the biggest point of confusion when we're dealing with surface tension, is how we define LC. So let me try to make this as clear as possible. The idea is, if you set an object on the surface of a fluid, or a surface of a liquid, okay, um, and you were to draw a line everywhere that this, that fluid is in contact with the surface, or that that, that, that object intersects the division between the liquid and the, um, the other phase, and you stretched out that line and measured it, that would be the contact line. So if you have something that is circular, okay, something like a, a hockey puck, Right, and you were to set that on the, the surface of a liquid, the contact line would just be the perimeter of that hockey puck. All right. If you were to, let's make this one a little fancier, make it 3D. Um, if instead of a hockey puck, you were to have something that kind of has a, a hole cut out of it, that's uh, something has a hole cut out of it, right? More of a donut shaped hockey puck. Um, and you were to put that in the water, everywhere that that is in contact with the water, right? Inside and out, you would add up all of those lengths. So if we look at it from the top down, I'm giving up on this 3D thing. Um, you would have the perimeter, the outside perimeter, plus the inside perimeter to describe the contact length. Yeah. What about all the concentric circles inside? Hmm? Like what, all the concentric circles between the smaller and the bigger one? So that's the thing, is those, those surfaces are not at the water line. You know, if you think about, right, you, those, are, those are submerged, but we're interested in where the object touches the interface between your liquid and your gas. Okay? So think about, here's another less appealing way of thinking about it. If you were uh, to have like really dirty water or something, you know, or, or really mineralized water, think of your bathtub. The line that is created that shows up as sort of soap scum or mineral stains in a bathtub or a toilet bowl, that's representative of like the contact line. Okay. Um, this is a confusing point because very frequently the things that were floating on the surface of the water, or we consider to float on the surface of the water, something like a paper clip. So if you take a paper clip and try to float it, you might think, all right, LC, unfold the paper clip, measure its length. That's not right, because it's in contact with both sides of that thin little metal wire, right? So it's actually going to be two times the length of that paper clip would be the contact line for surface tension. 
keep that in mind that absolutely tripped up like 60% of students that I've, I've uh, worked with in the past. So, the last thing that we're going to cover, and then we're going to go back and hit some examples, is another effect of surface tension, which we call capillary rise. We'll say this is due to surface tension, so we're clear. So when you have uh, like a, a, a solid wall, okay. let's say this is the side of a tank of, of water again, and you have your water filled to here, your water line is not going to be perfect perfectly perpendicular to that wall. What you typically do is you'll see the development of a meniscus, right? A little bit of curvature uh, between the wall and that water. And that will intersect the wall at some angle that we call the contact angle or or theta. So capillary rise occurs because right, this little film of water here has surface tension, which means that there's an element of force that's trying to pull this up the wall. Well, that's why you get that rise. Um, so when you have really thin tubes or really small spaces between like plates, uh, let's draw for example, the walls of a a tube that is, or a straw, you know, that's being stuck down into a liquid. What's going to happen is those forces are going to tend to pull the liquid up, the column of liquid up inside the straw a little bit. And we can actually figure out how large that capillary rise is using a simple free body diagram. Okay, so bear with me here. If here's our liquid. Here's our liquid. We'll, here's our contact angle, theta. This thing has a radius of r and is being pulled up to a height of an average height of h above the surrounding liquid. All right, so with that information, if we draw a free body diagram of sort of this slug of fluid that's sitting up above the fluid surrounding the straw. That is, if we were to group this all into a kind of a cylindrical little bit of fluid. So this is what's being taken from inside the straw. It is H high. It has a diameter of R. And We'll say that it is some liquid with density rho or specific weight gamma. Okay. So our free body diagram is going to look like this. We've got the weight of the fluid pulling it down, right, which is mg, which in this case is going to be rho times the volume times g, which would be rho times pi r squared times h. Okay, there's the weight of the fluid. And what's keeping it up? Right, it's the surface tension in that meniscus film. And that surface tension is sticking out here. It's not going straight up, right? It's out at some angle because it's directed along this contact angle. And that surface tension is going to be then, or the vertical component of that surface tension, we'll say this is df. The vertical component of that surface tension that's pulling it up, then, is going to be df cosine theta. Okay. So this is distributed all around the perimeter of this slug fluid. 
and the total combination of all the surface tension then is going to be sigma times 2 pi r times cosine of theta. So then when it's at equilibrium, right, we stick this, this straw into the water and, and then we will wait for it to reach a steady state, nothing's moving, we can go ahead and write the equilibrium condition, sum of the forces in y, if we go ahead and define y as positive upward, equal to zero, that is that 2 pi r times sigma times cosine of theta is equal to the density times pi r squared times h. And if we know what our liquid is, then we can look up sigma. We can look up the density. We'll usually be given the contact angle. Okay, that's not something that you're often going to find in a table. The expectation there is you're usually going to going to be provided with that information. We know the dimensions of our straw or our tube, right? R. And so the only thing left to solve for is H, which is the capillary rise. And so solving for H then gets us two sigma cosine theta divided by rho G R. Which means that we can calculate how high that column of water is going to rise. Why is this important? Why do we care? The idea here is not to know how high the soda is going to go up your uh, McDonald's straw. The reason we want to know this is because one of the most common methods of measuring like water height in industrial tanks and such is using things called sight glasses. Okay, where you'll run, you'll run a sight glass outside of the tank. It's sort of a metal or a glass straw, and you. Um, if you have a metal tank, you can't check what the level is. But if it's in equilibrium <laughs> with a a uh, kind of a brain fart in here, um, with this sight glass, you'll be able to, the, the water inside that sight glass or the liquid will rise and fall with the level in the tank. If that sight glass is really small, however, and if you need to know the level of the tank very precisely, this capillary rise can throw off your measurement. Because, okay? for example, clean glass tubes and water, that contact angle is close to zero degrees, meaning that that cosine theta goes towards zero, and it can cause significant capillary rise if you've got very small tubes. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and, um, so that wraps up for the, the content. Um, I'm gonna take the remaining time of class and go through some examples. We'll start with this one on capillary rise right here. Example, this is number 129 from the book. Um, so as I said, if we assume that, oh, so this is for surface tension. If we assume that the contact angle is approximately zero degrees for clean glass and water, and we consider a case where we have water at 60 degrees Fahrenheit in a tube with a radius of 0 0.125 inch, an eighth of an inch. So this would be similar to your typical drinking straw at a quarter inch diameter. Find first H, the capillary rise in that tube, and what happens to H if the radius is reduced by 50%. So if our straw decreases to the size of you know, a coffee stirrer. So we know that what we want to use is this expression that we just derived, that H capillary rise is equal to 2 sigma cosine theta 
rho g r. Okay, any simplifications we can make right off the bat? We've got this here, right? So if this is a glass tube, we know that theta is approximately zero, cosine theta becomes one. That goes to one, which leaves us with, we're looking for H, we gotta find rho, the density of water, at 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and sigma, the surface tension of water at the same temperature. Those are values you're going to get out of the table at the front of your book. So I posted these tables on Icon as well, for those of you that don't have a hard copy of the book handy. <laughs> um, but if we went ahead and looked on the liquids at water at 60 degrees Fahrenheit, we would see it as a density of 1.94 slugs per cubic foot and a surface tension constant of 0 0.00503 pounds force per foot. So water at 60 degrees Fahrenheit, sigma is equal to 0 0.00503 pounds force per foot, rho is equal to 1.94 slugs per foot cubed which means that we could find the specific weight or just, um, of water by multiplying the density by gravity to get 62.4 pounds force per foot cubed. And then the last thing we need, I'm doing that because remember rho g here, we could just replace that with gamma. Um, makes the units a little bit easier if we're working on pounds force consistently throughout. And then R, right, is equal to 0 0.125 inches, which is 0 0.0104 feet. Okay, so we've got everything we need. We can go ahead and plug those in to say H is equal to 2 times 0 0.00503 pounds force per foot divided by 62.4 pounds force per foot cubed times 0 0.0104 feet. So we could go through and we could say, all right, we've got some cancellations. Those go away. If those two go away and the pounds force cancel out, we are left with a 1 over 1 over foot. So Units of feet, that checks out. It's a distance or a length. Zero point zero one five five feet or zero point one eight six inches. So not too hard. It's just a matter of using the right fluid properties. And if you ask me, even more importantly, understanding why we get this effect. Um, OK, little, little uh, comprehension check in the second part of this example. What happens if we cut the radius of, the, um, of this glass tube in half? Does the capillary rise increase or decrease? Increases. By how much? Two times, exactly. So if you know it once, it's very easy to extrapolate it to other sizes. So for example, you're an industrial process engineer, you need to size sight glasses for a very sensitive chemical process. If you calculate the capillary rise with one size, okay, it's very easy to figure out what size you need then in order to get your capillary rise down to a tolerable um, number.
So here's problem number 178 from the book, and this is on cavitation. So whenever you have flow around sharp bends in pipes, what tends to happen is that liquid flowing through that pipe will have trouble kind of hanging on to the inside of this corner here. And what you get is a really low pressure region at that inside corner. So flow through sharp corners. Low pressures. So if we were to have a pipe and we were to stick a pressure gauge right here, what we would see is that the pressure at that point is much lower than it is going into the pipe or coming out of the pipe. Uh, so what is the minimum tolerable pressure at the inner corner if we want to avoid cavitation? Well, there's not a whole lot of calculation to do here, right? The idea is cavitation or localized boiling will occur if the pressure reaches what? The vapor pressure, which is a fluid property that we generally are going to look up in a table. So once again, if you go to your book, this one's going to be in Appendix B of the book, or you go into Engineering Toolbox or Wikipedia or really any reliable I'll give, make it that, that caveat, reliable source of engineering data for liquids, you'll often find a table that has water vapor pressures as a function of temperature. Um, so in this case, if we said that the water is at, what was our temperature? Uh, 160 degrees Fahrenheit. If we go to Appendix B, 1 in the book. The very first table in there, I believe. Table B1, physical properties of uh, water. So temperatures between freezing and boiling. We have density, specific weight, viscosity, surface tension, also varies with temperature, and vapor pressure. So at 160 degrees F from table B1, we get that PV is equal to 4.74 PSI. Okay. There's a little bit of a hiccup here, though. A little bit of a trick. Um, is that the pressure that we're going to be measuring on our pressure gauge? No. Because that's an absolute <coughs> pressure. All right. That's 4.74 PSI absolute. It says so in the heading of the table, actually. It says PV absolute, meaning it's relative to zero. Our pressure gauge there is giving us pressures relative to atmosphere, 14.7 PSI. So what is that number going to be on that pressure gauge? above or below atmospheric? Below, okay. So if the pressure gauge is relative to atmospheric pressure, it's going to be negative, right? It's going to re register a vacuum. And so it would make sense then we'd say our absolute pressure, okay, the pressure is giving us that minus atmosphere. So PV minus P atmosphere. In this case, it's going to be 4.74 PSI minus 14.7 PSI, it's going to give us a number about nine, negative 9.96 PSI. Okay. So negative pressures exist for gauge readings. They don't exist in absolute pressure. 
please make sure you get to know that. There's nothing, there's no nothing lower than zero absolute pressure. Okay, that's a complete vacuum. Um, and five minutes. Uh, I think actually we're gonna go ahead and call it there. Um, so you guys have a little bit of extra time. Uh, I have one little supplementary video um, dealing with surface tension and like a soap bubble that I'll go ahead and post. It's not great. I recorded it a few years ago. Uh, but I think that you'll have enough information to get through the surface tension homework uh, without too much issue. Come see me in the next hour or go see the TA later this afternoon if you need help.